There is a white field waiting for God's people to awaken out of their slumber and say, I am going to answer the call. I will be faithful. I will commit my life to the gospel. I will do what he's called me to do. And I will take responsibility for the loss of my generation. I'm, I'm hoping to continue the series that I've been on. In introduction, you know, I think the, the thing I want to start by talking about is that the, a lot of the things that, that we do are, um, they're derived from prime principles. What I mean by that is that it's very important that we're careful and conscientious and conscious of the things that motivate us. There are certain ideas or concepts or values that we hold that end up having a lot of downstream ramifications, kind of like you take your central principles, your guiding principles, either individually as a group of people, and they kind of like get thrown into the lake of your life, and they have these ripples that go out from them. For instance, here at Followers of the Way, we've, we talked about a sacramental understanding of the Eucharist and baptism. That, that, that primary principle has a lot of outlying causes and effects. In other words, if, if, if communion means is what we all say it means, then that, it makes some decisions down the road for us, like if we want to have meaningful weekly communion with people who know our lives well and can speak into our lives and we can speak into theirs, that is going to limit certain things like how many people can we have in, in communion together. You, you can't do that with 300 or 1,000 people. And so the decision about how big our congregations are going to be is preset by a prior conviction that you may not initially connect the two. And so this, what I'm talking about today is like that. There's a set of, um, there's a set of principles around how Followers of the Way has organized that has downstream consequences. I think that this is the sixth of those messages, but I'm not sure, so I, I'm not, I'm not going to write on the board, but I am going to write what we're talking about. I combined, I, when, I, when I did this Followers of the Way 101 series, I wrote down just a list of things that I wanted to cover, and this was two of them, and I'm putting them together. It's urban, fruitful, evangelism. So, I'm talking to you all in Malden, a mile from the highway that runs into Boston. So, it's a little bit of preaching to the choir. We're all here, right? So, you've already got the memo about urban, at least. But fruitful and evangelism, you know there's evangelism that's not fruitful? I I, I know that there's evangelism that's not fruitful. I've spent a lot of time doing evangelism that wasn't always fruitful. Um, but this is a really important concept and principle, and it's one of those stones that gets thrown into our church ethos that has a lot of reverberating uh, consequences. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, just for starters, you know, I'm, I'm going to share some stories, so if you're used to hearing all my stories... I feel sorry for you, because there'll be some repetition, but um, just by way of introduction, why urban? Um, evangelism, like, we don't have to have a big sell on this, right? Like, we all, we all think that evangelism is important. Maybe we could talk about how important it is and why. Uh, and in our first message, we talked about the gospel and what we're talking about when we say the gospel, and so that's an important part of this evaluation of what are we evangelizing, the gospel of the kingdom. Why urban? Well, when we open up our introduction, our uh, table of contents of the Bible, we have nine epistles, nine of the whatever, 27 epistles, 27 works of the New Testament that are written to major urban areas in the first century. And so by the first century, this is an important issue to me anyhow, being historically conscious, 
when Paul starts his ministry, he is going to major metro areas. And the fact that we have a Bible for us today, a New Testament today, comes in no small part because those major urban areas had developing churches that needed issues addressed and they needed counsel and they needed direction. And that's where our New Testament is collected from. The issues that arose from starting churches in these major cities. These were important cities in the Roman Empire. They were important trade hubs. And they all had their own kind of vibe and feel. And um, if you include the the epistle to Laodicea, which is missing but is mentioned, and if you include that the first three chapters of Revelations are written to also large cities and the bishops of those cities, you have, an, you have a lot of what is preserved for us is how to have urban churches. Maybe that's coincidental, maybe it's an accident of history, I don't think it is. It's, um, but, <clears throat> but we want to address this thought uh, that brought us together into these urban areas. When I, let's start with some stories. When I was um, in 2006, around 2006, 2005, I took a trip across country. I went all the way across the north and back through the south, a big, huge loop around the U.S. Um, Lazarus, before Lazarus was born. And I was visiting a lot of churches in that time. I was involved in a network of churches, and, and it had certain um, principles that were having ramifications that I wasn't aware of. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't fully put the pieces together. But as I traveled around through these network of churches, through conservative Christian churches, what I found from one end of the country to the other was that all of these churches were white, and all of them were rural. And this began to distress me more and more as I traveled across the country. I thought, surely there should be some diversity in the church. Surely, surely these views that we have of the kingdom of God don't only fit within white and or German frameworks. That there must be, there must be somebody somewhere who's reaching out across cultures. Because here's the thing that bothered me so much about it. Well, I lived in, uh, I had come from more ethnically diverse areas. I grew up in Southern California, and then I was in high school in a slightly more ethnically diverse area. But, but the real problem was this, is that one of the central themes of who Jesus is, is the breaker down of walls. The, the whole notion that Paul, that Peter has this vision that sends him to Cornelius that causes him to realize that the Gentiles too are partakers of the Holy Ghost and not just the Jews is the gospel breaking out of the Jewish ethno confines into the whole world so that everyone everywhere is supposed to be uh, susceptible to the witness of the gospel of the kingdom. And when we find ethnocentric churches, well, that either there's an ethnocentric area, like, a, 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 like for instance, Japan is a very, um, is a very uh, ethno-restricted area. It's almost completely Japanese people in Japan. So a church in Japan is going to be Japanese people. There's just not a lot of foreigners there. But I'm not in Japan. I'm in the United States, where there's lots of people from all over the world, and all the churches I were going to were all white. And this was a problem to me. Why isn't Jesus breaking across these barriers? And then, <clears throat> and then the fact that I had to go so far out to these remote churches began to put some questions in my mind. I heard lots of excuses for why this is. I heard that, you know, you can't raise children in the city and that the cities were godless and that you couldn't go there and there was no place for Christian morality among the heathens. And this, too, struck me very, very wrong. Where else is the church supposed to go? I mean, I, I, I asked myself back when I was doing these travels, are we supposed to be little enclaves? Are we supposed to be little islands hidden out in some remote place so that um, so that if, if someone ever wanted to hear about the gospel, they should have to come and find me, which was my experience when I left evangelicalism and was looking for more faithful witnesses, what I consider more faithful witnesses of the gospel and sermon on obedience. 
I had to go looking hither and yon out into the sticks in the hills to find people who were practicing Christianity a way that was meaningful to me. And I asked them when I showed up, why did I have to come looking for you guys? Why aren't you places that are accessible? Why aren't you being louder about this? Why aren't you giving a testimony to the world around you of who you are and why you are and what you are? Why do I have to come hiding over, come running over hill and dale through glen and woods to find the witness of Jesus Christ in the world? That's not how it should be. Didn't he send us? Didn't he tell us to go? Didn't, didn't the apostles write letters to the cities? So those were my early experiences that made me question some of these things, and I'll talk about where that changed in a little bit. But let's, let's switch track a little bit and talk about evangelism, the evangelism part of this, because this is the principle that weighs this, this whole premise. This has the most weight. This is what really matters. Um, and, and this matters, and this kind of follows after as a, as a principle. Let's talk about evangelism. What is evangelism? How does it work? How should we do it? Well, primarily, um, primarily evangelism comes from us, those of us in the church, having loving relationships with people outside the church. That's where evangelism comes from. I had the, the really good opportunity to talk with um, Lance and Marlisa yesterday. We were talking about this specific issue about evangelism. And, and, and one of the concerns that holds us back oftentimes is this idea that I don't know enough. I don't know the scriptures well enough. I don't know apologetics well enough. I don't know how to answer people. Uh, and I, I'm, I was encouraging them, and I'm encouraging everybody. That is way secondary of a concern. What matters for the church, what matters for all of us when it comes to evangelism is caring about the people around you. If you love the people around you, the people in your neighborhood, the people that you come across, the people that you cross paths with, if you love those people well, this is the hard part of evangelism. This is the thing that uh, for all the seminars I could give, for all the apologetics we could read, for all of the talks we could do, the part that's hard to instill in the heart of the church is love for people outside the church. This is the, this is the work of evangelism. Love the people around you. Care about their lives. I had a, I had a woman at my table this week, which she just happened to stop by. We were able to give her some food. She was a friend from afar. She came in. We start talking. She starts telling me all the troubles in her life. Why is she telling me those things? Because I care. Because I want to know. Because I want to figure out if there's some way to help. Because I want to at least, at least be burdened with the things that burden her. I want to at least hurt where she hurts. This is evangelism. And what happened, why I'm saying this so, so confidently is because when we make these connections with people outside the church and we, we care about their needs and we care about their life, then we want to, as friends, as people who love them, we want to help find solutions for their life. And it's not this like... Uh, it's not this notch on my belt that I won that I'm philosophically superior to an unbeliever and I convince them that I'm right and they're wrong. It's that I watch somebody's life grow from darkness and death and destruction and pain and sorrow into life and health and peace as someone that I care about. Them, not it. Them. I care about them. This is evangelism. And so when I make connections with people like this in my life, then... Then they, they see, we compare our lives. They see the things that work in my life. They see what's happening. They see with this woman that was at my table this week, I was like, how do you do that without a community? How do you go through all that sorrow? It's so hard for you to have all of that pain and all of that difficulty and to be all alone. I'm so glad that when I go through the difficulties and the trials of my life, I don't have to go alone. I have a community of people with me in the church who care for me and who love me and who take care of me. I wish you had that. That's not, that's, not, that's not apologetics. It's just caring about somebody. Now, how do I find people to care about? This is the next question. Where am I going to find the people to care about? Relationships with those who need answers and hope 
is the most important part of evangelism. Let's turn, I just have one text that I want to look at today, let's, and we'll look at it twice, but turn with me, if you have your Bible, to Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> It's a very interesting chapter in light of the things that we're talking about. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll start with, chap- with verse 10. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Uh, let's back up in 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that, what that meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, from not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They that be whole need not a physician. And this is, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a sidetrack, a separate issue, but I, I have, when I've talked to people, uh, when people have objections about coming to the city and the perils and the moral hazards of living in an urban city, I think of this all the time. For my part, where I'm at now, I would rather be an atheist New England than the Bible Belt. I don't, I don't have anything to offer people who, are, who say that they are well, people who have no needs, people who feel like they're good American Christian people who have it all figured out. That doesn't, I don't have anything to offer there. But here, I have things to offer. The discrepancy, the difference between my life and the culture around me matters. That's where, that's where the exchange of ideas happens. Because I'm one of the few people in my, you know, as I walk around day to day, I'm in a major minority of being a Bible-believing uh, Christian. The, 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 the difference between the philosophical worldview of the people that I encounter and me is where the movement is. That's where the, that's where the excitement is. That's where the opportunity is. That's where the, the, the chance to talk about something and to bring something up. Why are you here? Well, I moved here to be part of a Christian community. What does that mean? What is that? Oh, I also have 12 children. Why do you have 12 children? All this stuff, like just me being who I am in my community provides all kinds of opportunities in this environment because we're living different. There's a difference. So Jesus, it looks like very clearly here in Matthew chapter 9, is taking advantage of this principle. That he, he finds himself in spaces with people who need something, who are looking for something different, who have something that's propelling them inside to look for the difference. Why does it work there and it doesn't work here? How many, how, I mean... I think that divorce and remarriage is a scourge on America. What am I going to do about that? What am I going to do with that? Well, how about we present whole marriages that function well in a world that doesn't know how to do that? I believe that children are a blessing from the Lord, that they're not a burden, that they're not, they're not, um, they're not hateful creatures that become teenagers and hate your guts and go their own way. I don't believe any of that stuff. Well, how do I make a difference in that issue? I live with my family in front of people who don't know that, that, that that's possible. How about community? I, 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 I live in a place where the deepest community somebody has, many, many people have, in the millions of people that live here, is the Red Sox winning a game. That's their community. That's all they got. 
That's all that matters. All that ties them to people they live next to that don't know, they work in a cubicle next to that they don't know, that they're completely alienated, walking around in this world. Maybe they have some digital in, in, interactions with people that they don't really know online, but they're alone and isolated in the world. And I have this incredible opportunity of living in a robust community with families of families who love me and care about me and are involved in my life and come and help me and and help me grow, help me get through the difficulties of life. That's an amazing opportunity. Who doesn't want to see that? How many people here in this area don't know anything about the way that we live our lives? It's an opportunity, and that's, that's why we're here. Okay, let me tell you where, where my mind started to change about some of these things. So I went on this big, long trip, <clears throat> And I, I saw all these churches, and I was confused about some of the things I was seeing. And on that trip, I was gone for several months for that trip. And on that trip, I had some friends of friends who were talking about doing a church work in Bogota, Colombia. And, um, and things were kind of uncertain back in my home. And I, uh, I had a friend ask me, would you be willing to go to Bogota to do a work? And they told me what was happening there and... I said, well, I don't know. I've never, it's never been on my list, but I, I, I'd, I'd pray about it. And he said, well, you should. You should pray about it and talk to my friend and see what's happening there and see if your family would be interested. I think you'd be a good fit for there. So this was in the early 2000s. The FARC was still very busy in Colombia at that time. There was a lot of violence, political violence that was happening. There was a lot of cartel violence. There was a lot of drug violence. There was a lot of government violence. It was just an ugly, ugly place at that time. And so I knew that enough that there were some dangers implicit, especially in Bogota. So we went to the library, and we took our family, and we looked up books on Colombia and Bogota specifically, and we started reading statistics and figuring out what it would take to be there and if, if that's something we would want. And we started praying about it and all these things. And, um, and I decided at that point, Eric and I, as we prayed about it, I would be willing. If they wanted us to go, I'd be willing. But I had done a mental inventory about what it would take to go there. And so <clears throat> I, it ended up, I, I talked to some spiritual authority in my life, and they didn't want me to pursue that course, and so I left that aside. But then on those travels, I went through um, several urban areas, and I met something very different than what I had come across up to that point. The churches that I was involved with were all white and were all rural, and I went through L.A., and I met a group of people who were very urban and very multi-ethnic. And I was like, wow, this is a big difference. And I, and I was especially impressed with their children. And I thought, how are they raising such good children in this environment? And so I was kind of shocked by this because I was under kind of a paradigm that you had to live in the country, and you had to have goats for your boys, and you had to have chickens for the girls, and you had to have all these things in order to have a wholesome family life. And that's how we were living. I, I, I kind of bought that. You know, I had come out of evangelical world, and this was just the way, it was just a part of the package was of living a whole Christian life, was having this nice rural family business with animals and goats and all these things. And so now I'm in L.A., and I see these families that are just incredible, and I'm like, wow, well, maybe I'm missing something here. And I was driving north from L.A. back up to Oregon, in that long stretch of, of California. And I remember my whole family was asleep, and I started thinking and praying about this stuff. And I was putting the whole trip together. I was headed back to Oregon. I was a day from home. And I was just thinking about everything I'd seen along the way. And it occurred to me again, what would I have been willing to do to go to Bogota? Because I was really willing. I was, I was open to the idea. And I thought, I went through my list, and I said, OK, well, if I was, if I was to take my family to Bogota, I would live a much lower standard of living. We would be poor, essentially. I would be willing to live in a dangerous place. I would be willing to subject my family to physical violence for the sake of the kingdom. And I would feel like it was my daily obligation to build the church of Jesus Christ. Like, that would be the reason for going. Why else would I live this lower standard of living and subject my family to danger if it wasn't for the benefit of the kingdom of God? And I would use every interaction that I could to proclaim the gospel. And as soon as I ran through that list, that inventory in my mind, I thought, well, what on earth, 
why on earth would I go to Bogota to do those things if I'm not willing to go 15 miles south to Eugene, Oregon to do those things? Like, why should I go to Bogota and do all those things when I live 20 miles north of a major city in my own area where I know the people, I know the culture, I know the language, I know everything about the place. And if I haven't done that there, what business would I have going to Bogota? It makes no sense. And I've seen this pattern played out over and over and over again through the years that people who have not exercised themselves in fruitful evangelism in places where it's very easy and, and, and very economical to make a difference in the world for the kingdom of God. They don't do that, but they'll cross lands and sea. They don't have the experience and the practice of bringing people into the kingdom of God and establishing churches here, but they'll go overseas and try to do the same thing, where it's exponentially harder where you have to learn languages and cultures and acclimate and, and fund it and all these things. And I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. If I'm not going to do those things here where I have opportunities, then why should I? You know, the other thing that bothers me about this is that I, I grew up in, in, in evangelical churches where we prayed for the 1040 window, Voice of the Martyrs, we get the magazines, every, and pray for the 1040 window, pray for the 1040 window, pray for the 1040 window. All these countries that are, you know, in the Middle East where Christianity is restricted and persecuted, and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed from the time I was a little child in Sunday school all the way up. And then there were, in the, in, in the last 20 years, there were huge geopolitical crises that brought all these people into our cities. And now all of a sudden, where do we go? We prayed for them for 20 years. We prayed in our Sunday schools. We raised funds to send care packages. And these people move over to the U.S. metro areas in mass. And now we don't care. Now we want better immigration policy. Now we don't, we don't feel the burden to follow up on our own prayers. How many of us grew up in evangelical churches praying for the 1040 window? And all of these immigrants have moved into our major metro areas. And now, where are we? Are we moving to, find, to bring the gospel to them? It's like this heroism notion that if I go to Syria, that matters. But if I move to Philadelphia, that doesn't. It's, there's a Syrian population, there's an Iraqi population in Lowell, 20 minutes from us here. They're here now. And we have obligations to them here and now. And until we're good at reaching them here, why would we go to Syria? It doesn't make any sense. It's all about the numbers. Evangelism is conceptually, for me, it's sifting through the crowds to find my lost brother and sister. That's what evangelism is. Imagine your blood brother or your sister was lost somewhere in L.A. or D.C. or Chicago. And it's your job to find them. What would you do? Okay, you can't call them the phone, it doesn't work. You've got to go out and look for them. You'd, you'd, you'd make up missing posters, you'd stop and talk to people, you'd put your number out there, you'd figure out how to walk through, you'd figure out how to find, encounter as many people as possible to find your brother. Well, that's evangelism. Find your brother. That's the, the common nomenclature for evangelism. Find your brother. He's lost somewhere out here. Now, if I mean that, if that's a true proposition, and my brother is lost, and a group of us are going to try to find him, what are the chances that my lost brother is in I, the town I come from in Oregon had 600 people? Well, you can figure out if your brother's there with 600 people pretty quick, just knock on the doors. And I did that. I knocked on those doors. But it didn't take long go through 600 people. And he's not there. So where do I go? Well, you need more and more people. More, sift through more and more people. Keep looking. Keep finding. In this case, in the case of evangelism, though, we're talking about a percentage of people. And I, I, I'm sorry if this is too reductionist for people. I, I, I hope it's not... 
I hope I'm not just being intellectual about this pursuit. It is a spiritual pursuit. We need the Spirit of God to call people. We need the Spirit of God to give witness. We need the Spirit of God to help us in this prospect. I'm not saying it's just a matter of numbers, but it is a matter of numbers. Jesus says, broad is the way, and many there be that go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads into life, and few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. This is, the, this is the expression from Jesus that haunts me sometimes. Few there be that find it. There's only few that are going to find their way through the narrow gate that is the call of Jesus to the kingdom. Now, if it's your and my job to find that few, how are we going to do it? And what my fear is, what my concern is, and why it's worth preaching this again, even though we're all still outside of Boston, the reason it's worth reminding ourselves is because it's our responsibility. Our, we are responsible. If you, lead the, if you read the old revivalists like Leonard Ravenhill and some of those other guys, it's our responsibility to meet the needs of our generation's lost. God has a church here and now in this generation, and it is our job to find this generation's lost and to bring them into the kingdom. And I am afraid that God is going to hold us accountable to this job because he told us when he left to go. He said, go, go and teach them and baptize them. That's our job. It's why we don't just metaphysically disappear into, into the good life, the good hereafter when we become Christians because there's work to be done here and now. It's our job to find the lost of our generation. And that should burden us and it should bother us that, we're, that there's so many who are falling away. And if we're serious about that task, then I think that we'll make decisions based on that task to find a faithful way to represent that need, to address that need. If the purpose of the church is to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, how are we going to do that well? What percentage of people do you think are open to hearing the gospel? There's 8 billion people. Just pick a number in your head. I don't care what it is. Just pick a number. How, what percentage of people do you think are the few? It's a good thought exercise. Is it 5? Is it 20? Is it 30? Is it 40? How many is a few? I don't know. Can't answer that question. I don't know if it's healthy to have a definite answer to that question, but I know it's few. So if there's X percent of 8 billion people that are susceptible to the gospel here in our generation, how are we, who are the church, whatever thousands or hundreds of thousands of us there are, how are we going to meet that need? And are we even thinking about it? This is the other problem. Are we even thinking strategically about how to do this? In many, many cases, we're not. But, that's because, but nobody's going to approach their job that way when they need to pay their rent. Nobody's going to approach raising their children that way when you have to go through the trials of life. No, but we don't, we're going to take this frivolous, no-thought approach to anything else that matters in our life. Why do we take such frivolous, no-thought approaches to the gospel? It, it, it's because we aren't often living in the reality of our responsibility to the gospel. So it's back to the same thing I said before. If X percent of 8 billion are those that it's our job to find and bring into the kingdom to teach and to baptize, where shall we find them? And if it's not in the few thousand people who are around me, what do I do then? I get, I get calls and emails from, from time to time. Is there a church here? Do you guys have a church here? Are there people in this place? And... And I have some, you know, some pre-written responses to encourage people how to be faithful in the places that they are because that really matters. I don't, I, don't mean, I don't mean that in any trivial way. It's really important that people are faithful where they are. But I, but I also have these weird experiences. I, I took David with me. Some people asked me to, to preach. I don't remember where it was. If it was in, it was in Nebraska, somewhere in the Midwest. Some, some people had come across us and 
seem like really sweet brothers. They are really sweet brothers. I haven't stayed in good touch with them, but they, I flew into, I think, I think I flew into Omaha, and then I drove an hour and a half out from there, and I was following my GPS, and we were, I don't know, a mile or two from where I was, I was going to meet these, these folks at their home, and I stopped at a stop sign <clears throat> on this highway, and I got out of the car, because there was nobody around, and I walked into the middle of the intersection, and as far as I could see, in every direction, I counted four houses. And I, I told David, I said, I don't, I don't know how you're supposed to make churches out here. What, I mean, there's four houses that I can see as far as I can look. And I'm not saying that there shouldn't be Christians out there. I'm not making any claims about anything. I'm just saying, like, from a church planter's perspective, when I'm, when I'm thinking and living in concern of the gospel and how to reach people, what are the chances that these four people, okay, and then so even if they were, then what should these four people do? If I could convert these four houses, then what should we do together? I mean, I can't convert cows. I can't make churches out of antelope. I mean, sometimes I feel like people are taking the, preach the gospel, proclaim the gospel to every creature a little too seriously. Like, we need people. We need people. And what I've found is that it takes a lot of people to find our lost brothers and sisters. That's just my experience. Let's, let's look back at Matthew 9 again. Look what he says towards the end of this chapter. In uh, verse 20. Three. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making noise, he said unto them, Give place. Uh, let's go forward a little bit. 27. And when Jesus departed, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. They t- then touched their, he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it, but they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying it was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out devils through the prince of the devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved. When he saw who? When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And then saith he unto unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I was a street preacher back in the day and me and my buddies, Uriah's dad and me and some other people, we used to go almost every weekend down to the University of Oregon and street preach. We'd find the block parties, we'd go to the festivals, and we would scream our fool heads off trying to make a difference for the kingdom of God. And I went weekend after weekend, I spent hour after hour, and you know, it wasn't, there were things that happened. I, I felt like oftentimes there was a divine appointment with some person that I would talk to, and I'd feel like it was making a difference. But after doing that for years, there was very little fruit in the church. And over those years, as I, as I involved myself in that street ministry, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not against street ministry. Please don't mistake what I'm saying. I think there's a valid place for this. I'm glad that I did those things in my life. I don't do it a lot now, but I, I don't. It, it taught me a lot of things. It's kind of like short-term missions. It was good for me if it wasn't good for anybody else. And, but, I, but I would come home week after week, month after month, year after year, and I would say, I would look at this verse in particular, and I would say, Jesus, I believe that you meant this. I believe when you said, 
the fields are white unto harvest. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he send laborers in the field. But I'm working. I'm laboring, and I don't see this white harvest. Where is it? Where is this white harvest? Where are the fields that are white? Where are the people? And I would pray about this, and I would get down on my knees. I would go to my closet. I would think about it during my workday, and I would say, why am I not seeing what he saw? He, if you read this chapter, he goes from thing after thing after thing after thing, where there are needs that he is meeting again and again and again and again in people's lives. And at the end of this chapter, he says, the fields are white unto harvest. There is so much work to be done. I need people to bring in the harvest. And I'm out here screaming my head off, trying to get five minutes of attention from people around me to try to harvest, try to be faithful to what God says. And so I'm asking myself, am I doing it wrong? Is it because there's no persecution? Am I in the wrong time? Am I in the wrong place? Am I doing it the wrong way? Am I supposed to be doing something different? I tried all the techniques I could figure out. I did everything I could do. And all I knew was to stop for a while and, 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 and think about it and investigate what is God doing in the world around me. And it sent me on a 10-year crusade around the country where I was looking for where I could be and where God wanted me to, to, to put my hand to the plow and bring my family. And we were like gypsies for a while where we traveled in a bus and we, read, we took all of our school bucks with us and we went from this community to that community and we'd be here for a while and we went to that community. And I've watched some families crash doing that and I was worried. I was like, as a father, I said, where's the place where I'm supposed to be? Where is the place where I'm supposed to settle? How is the, how is the ministry that God wants me to, to, to do, to be in? How am I going to find that and be faithful to it? And I just kept putting one foot in front of the other, and I knew, I, I knew what I wanted. I wanted to be faithful. I wanted a people. I wanted a community. I wanted people who were committed to the gospel. And I kept putting one foot in front of the other. And I kept trying to be faithful. And do you know, it was a year after moving to Boston, I was looking at my schedule and I was trying to figure out, I had all these people that I was supposed to meet with and I was trying to figure out who was I not going to meet with because I didn't have time. I, and I realized the fields are white under harvest. There's more work to do here than I know what to do. If I had 50 men who spent their time investing in the kingdom of God, there would be more work to do than 50 men could do. There's literally more to do here than I know how to do. And I've spent the last several years of my life living in this entirely different place where the feel, I don't, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a paradigm change. And it's, it's, it's for a lot of reasons. I think God I think that we were faithful. I think we went the places God went, and I think we responded when he called us, and we were willing to pay the price we were, and, and commit ourselves to the things that were from him. All those reasons. But the fact of the matter is, through, a, through being, making faithfully those steps, we found ourselves in this place, in this place, where I can say with Jesus, finally, not just out of faith, not just out of believing that the scriptures are true, but, but believing it practically in my own life, the fields here are white unto harvest. There is more work to do here. And, there, and I believe that there's more work to do in Philadelphia and in Washington, D.C., and in L.A., and in Chicago, and in Phoenix, and in Seattle, and in Portland, all o and in Atlanta, uh, and all over this country, in all of these major cities, there is a white field waiting for God's people to awaken out of their slumber and say, I am going to answer the call. I will be faithful. I will commit my life to the gospel. I will do what he's called me to do. And I will take responsibility for the loss of my generation. The fields are white. And I think it's good when I was a young man, when I was a young street preacher, that I stopped to ask the question. I think it's good if, 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 if you find yourself in a phase in your life where it doesn't look like the fields are white, where you've got to believe it by faith, while you're wondering, where are these white fields? Where's the fruit that God has for me? Where's the fruit for my ministry? Where is my life working to create good for my king? Then ask. With some real humility, be willing to challenge your own, your own ideals. 
and what you're sacrificing in order to be faithful. There's a lot of practical things about, I think, people moving into urban areas, and I, I, maybe we should do another teaching sometime on that because it's getting late, but there's a lot of practical questions people ask about. I, I get asked all the time, how do you raise your children here? What do you do with them? What do you do with your sons? What do you do with your daughters? How does it work? What do you do with neighbor kids? How do you deal with this? How do you deal with that? And there's answers to all those things. It's just like, it's just like what I said about evangelism. The, the main thing is a heart. If you have a heart for these things, you'll figure out the, the details. That stuff, that's the easy part. The details are the easy part. The heart and the passion, that's the hard part. So I'm going to leave off of these kind of like stumbling blocks that people have with thinking about entertaining the idea of, of, of being in an urban area for the sake of the gospel. But I will say, I will say this, I wasn't willing to come alone. That's the one thing that I kept in my mind the whole time. As, I, as my mind was shifting, as I started to see that this city on a hill principle, like this is where God wants his people. He wants us visible. Let me tell you another way. I, I didn't have a plan to say this, but I will. One of the things that I realized after all those years of street preaching, one of the things that I came to be a, a deeply rooted conviction is that <clears throat> It's all well and good for me to drive 20 miles south and, and, and preach on the corners, talk to people, buy homeless people food, reach out to the drug addicts, whatever, whatever down and outer ministry you want to have. Or just talk to people walking around shopping, whatever the case is. It's all well and good for me to go down into the city and say, here's the answers for humanity's problems. Jesus is the Messiah. He came to establish a kingdom. He came to bring us into that kingdom. He came to show us a new way to live. He came that we could follow him into life and peace and eternity. That's wonderful. Glad for every, time, every example where that happens. But when I can't conclude that message with a very practical, come and see where we're living it, I have not properly communicated the gospel. In other words, I was going into the city and I was preaching these things, but the 20 miles from me and them might as well have been 200 because they, I, what, my life and my community and my family was not accessible to the people that I was preaching to. And the real punchline to the gospel is come and see how God's people live. It's a demonstration in real lives, in tangible lives, of people being made whole, people who were broken being made whole, people who hated one another learning to love, people who only thought for self, caring for others. All this work that happens in our lives in the kingdom of God, in our communities, all the examples that we have of God making people right and making them whole, that's the punchline to the gospel. It's not an idea. It's not a theory. It's a real practical kingdom where people are living that way right here and right now. That's the city on the hill. That's the thing that can't be hid. That's why, that's why he says that by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. Because that love manifests in a community and it manifests in growing, healing, whole lives. And those lives shine like the sun in a dark and forsaken earth. And people see it and they know it for what it is. And that's the mark of our discipleship. And it's the call to the kingdom. It's to come and see. It's to come and be a part of us. You could do this too. One of the things that brought us here was this desire for urban, fruitful evangelism. Let me, let me close with an analogy. I'll tell you about two lakes. Okay, I'll tell you about two lakes. There's one lake, it's beautiful. 
There's a lovely beach. There's chairs to relax in. There's umbrellas to hide from the sun. There's grass and playground for the children. It, the water is clear and exquisite. There's shade. There's a forest to walk around in. It's just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place to be. Many people want to go there. It's a nice day to spend a, spend a day with the family at this lake. There's another lake, and it's surrounded by concrete. It's dusty, and it's hot, and it's kind of ugly. There's no amenities. There's not even a bathroom. There's no water fountains. There's no playground. There's no beach. There's nothing. It's just concrete and water. In the nice lake, there's a few thousand fish. In the ugly lake, there's 300,000 fish. Now, when you go to the ugly lake and you see people fishing, what would you ask them? You think, why are you here? There's this beautiful lake right over here. It's got a nice beach you could sit on. You got swings for the children. There's a, there's a, there's a concession stand if you want a hot dog. It's just a beautiful place. Why are you at this ugly, ugly, ugly lake? And I can imagine that most people at that ugly lake will tell you, I'm here to catch fish. And that's the difference between who goes to which lake. I can tell you whose interest is catching fish and whose interest is having a nice day. And I am very concerned that with all of our lives, wherever we live, we're going to be asked by God, why did we spend the time that we spent at the lake that we were at? And it's well and good for us to assess, whether we live here or elsewhere, how am I investing my time in my life? Where am I putting my energy and my efforts? What's, what's the priority that I have in my life? And how is that going to, what, what am I going to answer to God when he asks how I spent the time of my sojourn in this life? Let's pray together and we'll have Abbott come and sing us a song. Sing with us a song. You don't have to sing it your own. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the witness of our King. We thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for your people. And we thank you most for our privilege in the gospel to have been met by the Holy Spirit with the message of Jesus as our King, the grace to respond, and the wholeness that came forth in our lives from these things. Father, we are indeed debtors to the gospel. Each of us, we owe you, we owe Jesus and his cross, and we owe our fellow man and our neighbors this debt to the gospel. I pray that you would help us to be faithful. I pray that you would help us, give us grace to have the right priorities. I pray, Father, with our King who said that we should pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the field. We care about your harvest, God. We care about what it cost you and your dear son to provide us a way. And we pray that, that laborers would come from far and wide. I pray, Father, that even that you would send others from other nations here to, to, to be missionaries into the cities of America where the lost abound and where the church is not meeting the needs, that you would send laborers from wherever you can gather them to come into this white harvest and bring 30, 60, and 100-fold forth for you, for your good and for the glory of your dear son, Jesus Christ. Amen.